As word spreads of well-known China critic Georgia Maloney being elected as Italian prime minister, we explore the current political climate in Italy, her proposed Indo-Pacific policy, and what that could mean for Taiwan and the world. Hi, and welcome to Taiwan Talks, covering the latest global news and analysis from a Taiwan perspective. I'm Leslie Liao. I'm Rath Wang. Joining us in the studio is Lai Yitong, president of the Prospect Foundation, a former Taiwan diplomat who is a renowned expert in international relations. And Marcin Yezhevsky, head of the Taiwan office of the European Value Center for Security Policy, a frequent commentator on Taiwan's relations with the EU. President Lai, Marcin, thank you so much for joining us. I spoke earlier to Francesca Giretti, an Italian analyst from the Mercator Institute for China Studies in Brussels on the economic and political implications for the two regions. I also spoke earlier to Enrico Cao, associate researcher at the Taiwan Strategy Research Association on the security implications of this development. Enrico is also originally from Italy. We'd first like to discuss how conservative Giorgia Maloney climbed to her top of her party, garnered an unprecedented support base to become Italy's first prime minister. Now, Marcin, could you tell us just about this wave of conservative sentiment just sweeping through the EU? It seems like we're seeing more and more of this conservative, uh, these conservative values just come to power. Is there a reason for this? And another question is, is this a larger trend specifically in Italy, or is Italy's rise in conservative sentiment independent of what's happening in the EU? While it might be useful to look at broader regional dynamics, at the end of the day, all politics is local. So in order to understand how Meloni became uh, hopeful to take over the seat of the Italian prime minister, we really have to understand the domestic dynamics in Italy, in Italian politics, that preceded the snap election that was held earlier this year. The previous uh, prime minister, um, the previous Prime Minister, Mario Draghi, was a technocrat. Former president of the European Central Bank was at the helm of a national unity government that was a very eclectic coalition of parties from across the ideological spectrum. And while the hopes for this national unity government were quite high, hoping that um, Draghi, with his technocratic background, would be able to put Italy on track of economic recovery and generally um, return to prosperity, there have been numerous internal cleavages that changed the dynamics. And uh, most importantly, there was an internal disagreement, particularly between coalition parties and the uh, movement of five stars in particular, that stopped supporting Draghi's proposals for stimuli package as a response to the um, energy crisis. Energy crisis is a topic that is now making headlines all around Europe. And Draghi's resignation uh, led to the um, snap election. So you had this national unity government consisting of different parties from across the ideological spectrum. And then um, Brothers of Italy, and Meloni's party, emerged as essentially the only viable alternative from the opposition. So I believe that we can understand Meloni's rise not only as a part of a broader European puzzle of a rise in uh, far-right conservatism, but more likely a quest of the Italian public to choose someone from outside. And Meloni clearly is an outsider, even though her uh, she's no newcomer to politics. Uh, let's remember that she's already the president of the um, European Conservatives uh, uh, fraction, uh, the European Conservative Party. She has an unusual background. Uh, coming from a working class family in Rome, being a woman, being raised by a single mother. She is very different from other players in Italian politics, even members of her own center-right coalition, which uh, involves uh, Silvio Berlusconi, known for his sex scandals. Uh, President, in an unusual display, uh, display of solidarity during her election, she openly opposed China's military threat to Taiwan, and she demanded the EU to exercise political and diplomatic means to deter a conflict across the Taiwan Strait. What is Taiwan's uh, significance to Italy and the EU amid this new environment that we're seeing, especially in this wave of conservatism? Well, I, basically the Taiwan-Italian relation, when we talk about it, um, a lot of the, uh, the quick conclusion was that, is that, that, that there, are, there are not much about it that we can talk about. 
but the issue is that the uh, Meloni came from a uh, position that um, traditionally the EU establishment tended to look at China from the p an economic angle, especially from the past Italian uh, political establishment. They tended to see in China as the um, a source of economic prosperity and opportunities. And so Meloni came from uh, that position and criticized it, uh, believing that the Italy did not uh, get enough or did not get much uh, from this engagement with China. At the same time, Italy lost much, especially the uh, COVID-19, uh, in which the Italy is the first European country that suffered the most uh, on year 2020, March. So those are, those are, those are, are were the histories that, that they have. But I think the, when we talk about the Meloni and her uh, conservative party, I think it is important to note that uh, before the, uh, <clears throat> the, the previous government and, and uh, before that there was a, a five-star movement, which already uh, signifies a, a significant trend in, within Italy about the conservative trend and the right-wing uh, tilt uh, about the Italian uh, political spectrum. And so Meloni sort of the, uh, came from, again, rising from that uh, position, rising from that political movement. And if we look uh, at the broader the European, uh, the so conservative movement in the whole Europe, uh, not just Italy, but also we saw the uh, Le Pen in France, that, uh, that was very strong. Uh, and the, uh, 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 in the England, uh, the uh, Farage is also uh, has been a political forces, as was probably others. And then not to mention about the, uh, uh, the in Germany, uh, the uh, well, alternative uh, right that is there, and the Netherlands that about th three years ago, uh, almost the Liberal Party almost took the whole power. So that we saw a significant conservative trend within the uh, European Union. And uh, one of the target about those conservative party movement is against the EU, and believe that EU is a super, uh, supranational, uh, super at, uh, the bureaucracy that reign over the whole sovereignty. So that there's a, ang uh, there, there's a, a dimension about the state sovereignty versus uh, EU and how they are dissatisfied with the EU performances and how the EU reign on them uh, take away about their uh, decision uh, for their own country. Uh, and uh, one of the significance about the uh, uh, Meloni is that uh, usually the Conservative Party, due to those uh, background, they're anti-EU and us, uh, they tend to support what the EU does not support, so that uh, their position toward Russia are basically uh, sympathetic to Russia's positions. And uh, about the China, sometimes uh, China has been looked at either as an um, uh, economic uh, alternative uh, to EU. So that's an interesting uh, twist. Or uh, the China ad, because the Chinese and uh, the Russians, their political ideology seems to be um, uh, sim uh, similar. And uh, due to their sympathetic to Russia, so they are sympathizing uh, with Chinese position sometimes. So that's how the, uh, the conservative movement, uh, when we look at it uh, broadly. But the Meloni defies all that. So how does support for Taiwan come in? I think it's basically about how they how she, how she does not uh, support China, so that the Taiwan has been looked at from this angle. Um, I do not know about the uh, what exactly that Taiwan can offer to uh, Italy, uh, especially in her mind, because he's, when she speaks about Taiwan, usually it's in the context about how the China does not an offer uh, the things that the Italy should have, and so they believe that the Taiwan could uh, might uh, have the potential. Oh, so it's could my potential. It is not something that already there. Uh, so that is the, uh, the context about the discussion with, regarding Taiwan. But of course, uh, when you look at potential, the uh, Taiwan's high tech uh, industries uh, and the, our econ economic uh, might, uh, many of them, they are compatible with what Italy can offer. So that uh, apparently added to the weight about what the, her position regarding Taiwan. Um, really quickly, President Lai, you mentioned something very interesting, was just that there's a wave of anti-China sentiment, and because the, the EU supports this, then the conservatives might uh, support what they don't support. And it, does this mean that anti-China equals pro-Taiwan? And if, if so, if this is the case, especially here in Italy, is this also a uh, product of this larger pro-Taiwan sentiment that's been going around the world? Well, I was usually the anti-China does not equal the uh, pro-Taiwan, and there's a uh, fine differences. But um, um, 
when the uh, the China is so dominant and uh, demanding everyone need to obey what China what China's uh, position should be, uh, usually that the anti-China they tend to support what China does not like, and Taiwan is the thing that China does not like the most. Uh, so that the, uh, the apparently uh, the, the 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 Taiwan tilt uh, started to emerge. But I think that Taiwan itself will also offer something, something tangible uh, to, the, to, to other countries. And so that they look at the, the Taiwan tilt and they can discover uh, there are really some, something uh, potentially uh, that will be beneficial to, uh, for both Taiwan and their own countries. Uh, our uh, industrial power, our technology advancement, uh, and also uh, our country as a, as a whole, uh, whether the, uh, the culturally or other things, that's what we can offer, especially in the Indo-Pacific uh, uh, advancement uh, for those countries that we wanted to have. Uh, Taiwan apparently uh, can offer very much. So that, uh, that started to add up the weight, that the anti-China, and they look at Taiwan, and they look at Taiwan and start to find something, and that something added up to more that they wanted to find, uh, find more about Taiwan. So that's, uh, that is how I see the dynamic. Marcin, really quickly, I want you, uh, I'd like to ask you to weigh in about Maloney is coming um, on this far right platform, anti-LGBT, anti-abortion. Um, she is not very friendly to multicultural ideas and immigration. But these are things that Taiwan is not just uh, proud of. These are values that we hold dear and sacred. Can Taiwan overcome these challenges presented by her party, especially since she's being so Taiwan friendly? I believe that this is a question that Taiwan is grappling with, not only in the context of a new potential uh, government to be led by Meloni in Rome, but also in general when it comes to interrogating the current state and potential future trajectories of um, Taiwan's international engagement. I believe that this is a question that we hear quite often in conversations about the importance or the rationale behind maintaining ties between traditional ROC diplomatic allies and, uh, and the country, uh, given that a lot of them have yet to reach the status of uh, a poster child of successful democratic um, consolidation. This is a conversation that is relevant when we talk about relations between Taiwan and the European Union um, as a bloc, because one of the um, most outspoken members of the European Parliament, who was the rapporteur for the first ever standalone reporter um, on, on Taiwan, is also a member of a, a far-right party in Sweden that is also accused of having uh, neo-Nazi leanings. So that's a question that we should not only discuss in, the, in, in, in terms of Meloni. To what extent can Taiwan continue down its path of essentially framing itself as a normative power when a lot of its friends overseas do not share the same normative underpinnings of uh, when, when they reach out to Taiwan? All right, uh, let's move on to Francesca Giretti, an analyst on EU-China relations from the Mercator Institute for China Studies in Brussels and the author of the Belt and Road Initiative in Italy, the ports of Genoa and Trieste, on what this potential warming of ties between Taiwan and Italy could mean, as Italy is the home to the largest Chinese population in Europe and has long been one of China's most popular overseas investment destinations. Rath spoke to her earlier. Let's take a look. While on one hand, we need to bear in mind that that was the campaign. So we need to remember that, you know, all these parties and all the expert, all these exponents, they were trying to uh, come out with very strong statements and with very strong um, positions. On the other hand, we also have to remember that Meloni has been, to a certain degree, quite china skeptic for the longest time. Even when she was part of the Berlusconi government in the early 2000s, she was, you know, actively um, supporting uh, um, Tibet. And therefore, it shouldn't come too much as a surprise that this is her position towards Taiwan. Moreover, of course, uh, there are economic interests, which is, you know, the idea that, you know, the closer Italy becomes to Taiwan, then probably the better deal it would get out of um, securing supply chains for semiconductors, for example, for its own businesses. So we need to balance these two elements. One is the campaigning element, and the other one is the fact that indeed there is a core where the soon probably to be prime minister has an interest in uh, uh, displaying a narrative at the very least that is pro-Taiwan. After all, she's probably 
I don't want to say the only um, exponent, but definitely one of the very few that has uh, um, guarantee, granted sorry, um, an interview to Taiwan's central news agency during her campaign, which is quite unusual for an Italian PM to do so. Is this because of seeing Taiwan's importance or do you feel it's because of her uh, China critic, kind of anti-China sentiment? So I don't think one excludes the other. Um, I think on one hand, there are three elements why the Maloney, well, her position towards Taiwan is, as we've defined it so far, warmer compared, or at least, you know, vocally warmer compared to other prime ministers. One is what I told you before, which is the sort of this, I think anti-China is a bit strong of a word, but definitely, you know, China skeptic, PRC skepticism. The other one is definitely seeing the advantages of being, of having a good relationship with Taiwan economically, but also, you know, if we think about the, uh, the general asset of the, the international community, it's quite likely that, you know, uh, Meloni sees Taiwan as a, a good and a positive actor. But we also need to remember the third element, which I do think plays quite an important role, which is the fact that Meloni, during the campaign, has been growing a closer relationship towards um, what is the Washington line. So probably she was also trying to display a policy towards Taiwan that would please Washington, and this is likely to continue during the government. Will there be a change in Italy's role in the G7, given that um, she's been more um, active in terms of supporting Taiwan and being more vocal about that support? I think so. I think there will be a little bit of a change. Um, the main reason is that at the end of the day, this is a populist government. So we've seen in the past how populist governments, Italian populist governments at the very least, tend to be much more vocal in the international scene, which means, of course, that yes, for sure, we're going to see changes in the G7, but probably they're not as negative as people think they would be because of this closing up between Washington and Rome. Should the administration change and should we get not only a Republican government, but a Republican government led by Trump, then of course we would still have Rome close to that type of government, and that of course the line would change in accordingly. What does that translate to in terms of support for Taiwan or policy towards China? The only thing that I can see that may be a little bit at Taiwan's disadvantage, if anything in the long term, is the idea of you know diversification, the idea that we cannot be as um, reliant on just one source of uh, uh, one source for um, semiconductors and other high technologies. So in that regard, probably you would see more of a push towards reshoring. How does that affect ties with Asia, especially Taiwan and China, given that um, like in the United States, they mentioned how um, jobs have gone to China and um, the anti-immigration wave. If you think about the aftermath of the financial crisis and the euro crisis, everybody was very much going after Chinese investments and, you know, getting into the Chinese market as much as possible, or taking advantage of the entire, um, you know, Chinese capital offer that suddenly, not suddenly, but, you know, that, that was there much more substantially than before. And that sort of uh, lived together with a sentiment that, you know, China was still selling much cheaper products, mostly manufacturing products, and in the case of Italy specifically, textile products, and that, you know, um, Italian manufacturing could not um, compete with Chinese manufacturing when it came to this. So you had this sort of uh, um, ambivalent position on one hand, people really, businesses really wanted to take advantage of the situation. On the other, you also had this grievance towards this uh, quote and unquote newcomer into the market that was pushing the, the locals out. What's the balance now? Do you see it going towards, um, you know, business opportunities or do you see it going towards um, being wary of China's investments? I think he definitely went towards being wary of China's investments, like 100%. On the other hand, I do think that businesses are still very much uh, committed to the Chinese market. And the reason why you now there are movements toward diversification is not because businesses 
got warier of Chinese investments or investing in the Chinese market is because of the dynamic zero COVID policy that made the, the regulatory system and the business system so unpredictable that then businesses decided, you know, we need sort of an insurance that uh, we're not going to lose such a big chunk of our business if this, I don't know, if a port gets locked down or if a business gets closed. So yes, sentiment has definitely moved in the direction of a warrior feeling towards China, which to a certain extent comes with a warmer feeling towards Taiwan, but at the same time is not necessarily stable. We'd now like to explore the economic implications of having a potential China critic in office and what that means for Taiwan and global trade. First question would be um, to Mar Marcin. I want to ask you about this China resentment in Italy. Um, there are over 300,000 Chinese um, citizens living in Italy with an extensive network of Chinese businesses, um, Chinese employees. Um, how has this got into the mold of Italian society? And has there been a resentment that has translated to support for Taiwan and this huge anti-China backlash? Mm -hmm. uh, definitely, the Chinese diaspora is uh, one of the largest non-EU communities in Italy, specifically the third largest. And uh, Chinese people in Italy are concentrated primarily in regions with uh, prominent textile uh, manufacturing centers and also in the north, in the vicinity of Milan. And while I wouldn't necessarily say that uh, resentment towards Chinese Italians has translated into the electoral decisions during the snap election earlier this year, we definitely have to consider how the COVID-19 pandemic and the rise of anti-Asian racism has also affected societal dynamics within Italy. Italy became one of the first countries outside of Asia that really saw the impact of COVID-19 pandemic. I think that a lot of us recall the very drastic images from February and March um, 2020, when Italian uh, healthcare system has almost collapsed. There were huge issues with even uh, processing the bodies of people who have fallen victim to the, to the disease. and. Um, because in the early days of the pandemic, it was much more acceptable to single-handedly blame China and by extension people of China, dehumanize them as a f form of punishment, I guess, for uh, the rise of COVID-19. Anti-Asian racism has been very much on the rise in Italy and it has fueled the dynamics that allow the biologization of nationhood, the biology, uh, dynamics that allowed for biologization of what it means to be Italian. And while I wouldn't necessarily draw causal linkages between these two dynamics, we also have to understand that far-right parties about uh, which we um, talked earlier in, in, in the interview often make those uh, very nativist, often racist appeals. And um, the conversation that has come to be on the on the Italian right about, for example, a complete naval blockade to uh, stop the influx of um, asylum seekers and, and economic migrants from Northern Africa and the Middle East and um, similar conversations that are essentially shaping uh, Italianness as whiteness are, are um, a part of this of this broader picture. But outside of whiteness, has there also been a backlash in terms of specific PRC investment policy? Like we've seen that in Africa, we've seen that in other parts of the world, mm -hmm. um, not in part of white um, Italian nationalism mm -hmm. per se. Yes, so I, I did make the connection to, to, to nativism and uh, those uh, false connections between uh, biology, culture, and national identity because we started the conversation by delving into the dynamics between the Chinese diaspora in Italy and the rest of the society. But the economic angle is definitely there. And uh, Dr. Lai, in his comment earlier, mentioned that um, whenever we talk 
about regional integration, for example, in the form of uh, EU enlargement or the deepening of EU integration, there is the question of how much of national sovereignty the population is willing to give up for the sake of integration. And I think that globalization and especially expansion of China's economic footprint is really uh, putting those questions once again in uh, front of our very own eyes. And that's because increasingly promises of Chinese investments are not viewed only as lucrative deals, but essentially as threats to uh, national security and threats to sovereignty. China is basing a lot of its uh, global ambitions off of the idea of becoming a maritime power. That is very clear in the case of Italy, where some of the uh, most significant promises that were made around the time when the uh, Belt and Road Initiative Memorandum was signed in 2019 were related to the expansion of um, uh, Chinese presence in the ports. So um, all around Europe, concerns about what having uh, Chinese invest in ports means for national security have been at the very forefront of the, of the public debate. So I think it's both. There are those societal uh, concerns about what it means to be Italian, but then um, on top of uh, that, there is also a more economic conversation about statehood and nationhood. Now, um, Marcin, you did mention that there is a huge Chinese population in Italy. And at the same time, you're saying that we're seeing Chinese investment these days as something that might be a threat to national security. However, that is still investment. That still is money, capital, job opportunities. Now, I'd like to pose my next question to Dr. Lai, who is we see um, interaction between other countries with Taiwan. Some countries are starting to opt to interact with Taiwan for one country, Lithuania. Um, but we also see this kind of situation where other countries are expecting Taiwan to kind of pick up the slack. I think just a few weeks ago, the Paraguayan president straight up said he wanted uh, one billion US dollars in investment from Taiwan, and the implication was there to maintain ties. So uh, Dr. Lai, as a former diplomat, you understand this push and pull. How much expectation is there here to, for Taiwan to kind of make up these economic gains for other countries or these investment opportunities? Well, uh, in the Prague case, of course, the, uh, uh, the president uh, seems to make a very public plea. Uh, sometimes, sometimes people feel that public threat uh, about the, uh, the uh, Taiwan and Prague uh, tie. I will say that um, um, even though if we uh, really give them uh, or uh, try to offer them uh, this amount of the, uh, uh, the deal in order to secure, if that is the, the backbone for the uh, uh, Taiwan and the Paraguay to continue the diplomatic relations, uh, sooner or later, probably two or three years later, probably they will come up with something more. Uh, so that uh, it is not a sustainable uh, foundation uh, for uh, this relationship to, con to continue. And basically, Taiwan is a uh, market economy, so that the uh, government cannot dictate uh, the individual business, their own dis uh, the business decision regarding where they want to invest, uh, who they want to uh, uh, do business with. Of course, there are national security concerns, but that is concern is based on how this impacts the whole nation, rather than how the nation can dictate individual business that uh, you need to do business with which country, with which people, uh, with whom. Uh, so those basically they are the, uh, 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 when we talk about Taiwan, uh, Taiwan our economic policy, uh, that uh, there's a natural constraints how the government can do. And uh, the, uh, regarding the, uh, the ties and how the economic relationship with them, uh, basically I would say that um, um, Although some countries, they do want it, uh, uh, some short-term, uh, quick uh, return, uh, economic return, uh, uh, as the price for the continue or the uh, establishing the uh, relationship. But um, uh, without a uh, sound market uh, foundations, uh, those ties and those economic engagement, that will not last long. Uh, we do know that uh, from China, uh, many of the things that China offer like 10 or 100 times better than Taiwan, but they just look at Italy, for example, and others. Uh, they sooner or later they just turn uh, to the other side, and uh, they look at many of the downsides about the, those those kind of forced uh, economic activity, rather than the natural flow from the uh, from the um, foundation of the market economy. And so that I will say that uh, although it could be a pressure, but uh, uh, we need to stick with the uh, the fundamentals. Uh, that will make everything click. 
uh, not just for some quick fix. Probably that can grab the headline, and even probably Taiwan will lose some of those diplomatic relations. But um, uh, those uh, even uh, losing of those uh, would not make up for the uh, the losing of the fundamentals. I'll I'll stick with those. Uh, when you say fundamentals, can you elaborate uh, funda diplomatic fundamentality or is it economic fundamentality? I will say that economic fundamentalities, that uh, uh, there's a, a natural flow, a natural law about the market economy. How the market can dictate uh, where the, the people can uh, 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 can have benefit uh, due to the, the, the natural law, how the, uh, the people uh, in the free association, uh, in the free economy that can do. Um, <clears throat> try to force something on some or, or uh, in somewhere and on somebody that will not last long. And uh, basically, uh, either, either, it's either a coercion or threat or a bribe. Uh, none of those can uh, have a lasting foundations. Uh, Marching, do you agree with uh, Dr. Lai's uh, inspection here? This insight about economic uh, letting just the free market dictate things and trying to keep that separate from diplomatic gain. Absolutely, and I believe that even within the context of uh, a market economy that is a very fundamental part of uh, Taiwan's appeal internationally, um, the government has some room to maneuver. I think that the launch of an investment fund for Central Eastern Europe is an example of incentives that the government may provide, but at the end of the day, that is the fundamental difference in dealing with China and dealing with Taiwan, that free market mechanisms in Taiwan are much more respected. And I believe that um, something, I believe that one aspect of, this, of these dynamics that is uh, lacking in conversations about Taiwan's attractiveness is that uh, due to the respect for free market, dealing economically with Taiwan, whether in terms of investment or uh, expanding trade relations, carries a lower political risk than dealing with the People's Republic of China. And when we talk about um, economic volatility, it's really not only about the purely uh, economic dynamics, it's also about uh, the political risk, whether your property rights will be upheld, whether the courts will be sufficiently independent to really um, safeguard your rights in, in terms of a potential conflict. But uh, something that I really want to emphasize here in the specific context of Italy is that while we have uh, already talked about the importance of fostering linkages between Taiwan and Italy in the semiconductor sector, when we look at the language that has come out of Rome earlier this year, but before the election, it appears to me that the economic aspirations that Italy might have towards Taiwan really go beyond just the semiconductors. And I think that this is always really important to remember that Taiwan has more to offer to the world economically than, than just the chips, uh, even if we want to think about them as the new gold. So Italy has yet to follow Germany, France, and the Netherlands in coming up with its own holistic Indo-Pacific strategy. However, in January of this year, Italy came up with its Indo-Pacific document where it outlined Italian contributions to the overall EU strategy for the Indo-Pacific. And interestingly, Taiwan is mentioned explicitly in this document, specifically in the context of economic linkages, with the um, Italian top diplomats advocating for more cooperation with Taipei, the word Taiwan is not used, it's Taipei, uh, in two sectors, in electromobility and energy storage. The two sectors uh, in which expansion would be beneficial domestic developmental goals as well, as they could help move the country closer to its um, carbon goals by 2050. So chips are important, but it's not the only area where uh, linkages can be built. And I think that the point about broader complementarity that Dr. Lai raised earlier is really worth um, delving on a little bit farther. Very interesting insight, Marcin. Actually, I have a perfect follow-up question for that. Now, you said Italy's new Indo-Pacific strategy is in line with what the EU put out. Is that correct? So Italy doesn't have an Indo-Pacific oh, strategy doesn't. yet. Yes. It has produced an Indo-Pacific document, which is a, a publication of a lower rank than a comprehensive mm. strategy, but it outlines how Italy seeks to contribute to the overall EU uh, strategy. So yes, there is growth in how 
Italy wants to expand its presence in the region, both in economic and security and social terms, in line with EU's overall pivot to the Indo-Pacific. Is this going to be a problem for Maloney, who uh, we have said is uh, trying a more isolationist strategy who, um, and trying to rem distance herself from the EU? But this is also, at the same time, this document is pro-Taiwan, which is in line with her platform. How is she going to have to navigate this in a way that is consistent with her beliefs as well as what she's expressed about Taiwan? Yeah. I, I do not believe that this document is contradictory to uh, foreign policy aspirations of Maloney, because at the end of the day, I believe that the Indo-Pacific is a concept with very strong normative underpinnings that Maloney emphasizes when she talks about Taiwan as well. When she talks about wanting to work closer with Taiwan, she talks about always supporting countries that stand for democracy and sovereignty. The idea behind closer Indo-Pacific integration, the concept of uh, the free and open Indo-Pacific, also preaches similar norms and values. So I think that from the normative perspective, there is clearly consistency there. And then a second point is related to Taiwan's place in Italy's or essentially any other Western countries um, in the Pacific or foreign policy strategy. I think that we shouldn't always look at expansion of ties with Taiwan as a dichotomy between um, expanding or uh, diminishing relations with China and Taiwan. I think it's much more useful to think of Taiwan as a, as a piece of a broader Indo-Pacific puzzle. So here, the outreach to Taiwan and uh, the understanding of importance of Taiwan starts to make more sense. Taiwan is not supposed to be a substitute market for China. Taiwan is not supposed to be a substitute source uh, of investment on its own. It's about understanding the growing importance of the Indo-Pacific. And that is consistent with what Italy has been doing. For example, Italy established a new trilateral dialogue format with India and Japan the two countries that Taiwan also views as strong allies regionally. And then my last point is uh, related to your implication that Meloni seeks to distance herself from the EU. And I think that we have to unpack this claim a little bit more because Meloni is not a traditional Eurosceptic who just seeks abandonment of the European Union. She is very active in ECR, a uh, European party, and uh, Oftentimes, she described herself as a Euro-realist rather than a Eurosceptic. And ever since the process of the European integration started with the European coal and steel community, we in Europe have debated how the future trajectory of integration should look like. And the debate between a more confederal model and more federal uh, model of European integration continues. And I think that uh, Meloni recognizes the benefits of a more confederal uh, Europe of nations kind of model of integration versus the United States of Europe. So uh, I think it remains to be seen how uh, the center-right government in Rome will play into those dynamics. Uh, we are having this conversation shortly after the summit of EU ambassadors where Joseph Borrell explicitly address the potential threat stemming from the rise of far right in Europe and how it could undermine uh, European unity on uh, the implementation of its common foreign and security policy and common security and defense policy. But I think it's a little premature to simply say that Meloni is a Eurosceptic who seeks to distance herself from the EU. It's great how you mentioned how um, Maloney is trying to um, set up this new um, EU kind of being different from, you know, her, her predecessors and all. But Indo-Pacific and all that, a lot of it's U.S.-led. How much do you think it could change if, say, um, the U.S. would have a new president or, a new, or the Republicans come into power? Do you, do you see a dramatic change in that? As, as um, Francesca talked a bit about how M Maloney is trying to align more with the U.S. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. However, when it comes to the U.S.-China policy, I uh, think that there is um, really a lot of bipartisanship in, in shaping U.S. policy towards Taiwan and also U.S. policy um, towards China. I think that 
even though the two parties in the US disagree on a lot and they may disagree on means towards uh, managing China, this end uh, of, of, of managing an increasingly belligerent regime in Beijing is shared. So, um, of course, we have to pay attention to transatlantic dynamics, but I wouldn't necessarily consider them to be um, a source of, of, of major change. I think that when it comes to those transatlantic dynamics, a more interesting question is to what extent can we see uh, unity between the 27 member states in embracing more transatlantic approaches, in allowing the EU to align itself more with Washington rather than trying to pursue a third wave, so to say. Dr. Lai, there's a quite, uh, Marcin brought up a very good point in that uh, relations with Taiwan with other countries, it's always a pick and choose between China or Taiwan. And that's just how we've seen uh, with the last wave of diplomatic breaks with the Solomon Islands, the Dominican Republic. Um, it always seems like it has to be a choice between Taipei or Beijing. Now, is there room to navigate within this model or is this just how things have to work on a, I don't know, maybe an international law standpoint, or is, just, is this just how things have been working for the past number of years? I think the uh, uh, people uh, were, well, uh, have been asked to choose between Taiwan or China. That is the, the Chinese imposition, that they want uh, those country or the people to choose. Uh, either you, you choose Taiwan without us, or you, you will be with us without Taiwan. Uh, but I think Taiwan and other countries, uh, apparently, they do, we do not want this to be a zero-sum choices. That you can be friends with Taiwan and also have your relationship with China. Uh, that is a thing that uh, uh, the Taiwan does not oppose. So it is Chinese position that they want other countries to have either or. Uh, but that is not Taiwan's. Um, and also, it's, I believe also it is important to uh, look at Taiwan also merit. So that uh, when they look at the, the Taiwan, it's not about how your relation with how, how the relation with Taiwan is a function of your relation with China. And uh, from that, you can study to see the opportunity where by engaging with Taiwan, how Taiwan can bring with you and what you can find uh, by uh, working with Taiwan. Uh, so that the, uh, whether that's in economy, in culture, in other uh, scientific or technological operations, uh, those are the things that uh, Taiwan is very good at. And also you look at Taiwan. Uh, Taiwan's GDP is, uh, in terms of the EU standards, uh, we are uh, on par with the Sweden. So basically, Taiwan, if we put Taiwan in, within the EU, uh, Taiwan is number six or number seven uh, the powers uh, in the EU, uh, and bigger than probably the rest of 21 or 22 of them. Uh, so Taiwan is not a small place. And there are countries uh, like this, when I study to see Taiwan, uh, as it is, rather than uh, Taiwan as replacement of something. Uh, of course, uh, as a recent development, uh, people found out that uh, due to the U.S. Uh, close attention to Taiwan, so there are some e uh, European member states, European Union member states, they look at Taiwan uh, and the engagement with Taiwan is also part of their uh, wider engagement with the United States. They want to improve their relation with the U.S. so that they want to improve their relation with Taiwan. So there's this angle. But I will say that um, um, uh, f this is just one of them. But uh, if you look at that, some of the, the re uh, really recent uh, development, uh, they started to find out what Taiwan is and what Taiwan means. And finally, I will say that the uh, Indo-Pacific strategy, uh, as uh, the, uh, um, uh, the Italy is about to put out, or the Italy uh, has already had a document, uh, is in line with the recent, uh, the earlier um, trend uh, among some EU member states, uh, such as the uh, Germany and uh, France. France uh, come up with its Indo-Pacific strategy in year 2018-19, and Germany in year 2020, and also Netherlands, uh, November year 2020. And the three of them, they joined together to push for the EU to come up with its EU-Pacific strategies. And, right, and later, you really did that. So that when the, uh, the Italy uh, wanted to come out with its own, uh, <clears throat> or uh, probably we're just on in the lower end of the document, um, basically is in line with the whole EU trend about how the EU find itself its rule uh, in the Indo-Pacific development. And when they look at Indo-Pacific and find, uh, trying to strengthen uh, their engagement with uh, countries in this area, they found out Taiwan is just right in the middle. 
And not only geographically we're in the middle, but also in terms of economy, in terms of technology, we are right there. And you have to engage Taiwan in order to have a meaningful Indo-Pacific uh, tilt or engagement. So I think this, this, is the, uh, this also represents uh, the, the, the another newer uh, momentum about uh, how they look at Taiwan. We just spoke about Taiwan's role in the Indo-Pacific and what Taiwan has to offer to Italy and its economy. Let's now hear from Enrico Cao, associate researcher at the Taiwan Strategy Research Association and political and security affairs advisor at the Taiwan Business Leaders Forum. Cao is originally from Italy and speaks about the military and security implications of warming Taiwan-Italy ties. Let's take a look. Italy and Taiwan have always enjoyed uh solid relationships in terms of public diplomacy and some of these have also been institutionalized examples of these include the, include the taiwan friendship group in the italian parliament uh, the italian taiwanese forum uh, for economic industrial and financial cooperation so in this regard georgia meloni's uh, policy statements uh, on taiwan um, are in a sense a continuation of of uh, even though on, an, on, a, on a bigger scale a continuation of uh, a long-standing relation with at least part of the Italian political establishment. This uh, kind of situation is not uh, related entirely to domestic factors. Uh, one of the factors is the geopolitical situation globally has changed vis-a-vis -vis China. Uh, negative views from the West uh, forced uh, most of the Western countries, of course, to uh, take a more wary stance towards China. And this, of course, uh, has uh, uh, helped uh, Taiwan to gain um, some ground uh, in terms of support across Europe, not just in Italy. Now, when it comes to the nature of, of uh, uh, relationships between between Taiwan and uh, and Italy, I don't really think that they will uh, entail uh, the security dimension or uh, staunch support for Taiwan uh, on critical issues. Uh, so we'll have. Uh, you know, sounder um, trade relationships maybe. Italy will be able to support Taiwan on specific issues, but these will be circumstantial, uh, as it has been the case uh, in the case of Russia. In the case of Ukraine, you've also seen Italian forces support Ukraine with um, weapons and all that. Would you see that happen to Taiwan? I, I don't really uh, think at the moment, uh, I'm speaking about, about the present, of course, in the future, uh, it's difficult to predict. Uh, security support uh, from Italy towards Taiwan, I think it will only materialize uh, in the case of China aggression. And should NATO decide or the EU decide collectively to intervene uh, to help Taiwan. Now, when it comes to NATO in the Indo-Pacific, um, we see increasing increased presence of NATO in sparse order. NATO countries, Germany, is planning to have um, permanent um, forces in limited numbers. Uh, we've seen France; they've been participating in recent Australian military exercise exercises. Uh, Black Peach in uh, late August. Uh, so uh, Italy uh, will be included in those. Uh, uh, type of relationships for security. I don't see Italy at the moment supplying uh, weapon systems or other things. Also because that uh, specific side is mostly covered by the United States uh, through the Taiwan Relation Act. Enrico, going back to the economic aspect, as you mentioned, there would be more cooperation with Taiwan. Um, is this also because there has been some difficulty in doing business with China and the Belt and Road Initiative? I don't think there have been uh, specific difficulties with China. Uh, I mean, all, all agreements that Italy had um, with China on the Belt and Road, including the, the MOU in 2019, were um, a simple uh, evolution, a uh, development of their times. And at the moment, as far as I know, the MOU in 2019 was signed because Italy was uh, lagging behind other countries in Europe that they were having much um, important volumes of trade compared to, to, to Italy. So Italy wanted to step up a little bit uh, trade relationships with China. Uh, they signed the MOU, which uh, uh, as far as I could recall, I, I remember reading the MOU, um, 
uh, it was a confirmation of already pre-existing relationships in in uh, in uh, to a large extent. Uh, so you don't so, think out of the. I don't think I, I. I don't really think that uh, expanded relationships with Taiwan will translate in uh, uh, downsized relationship with China. Now, uh, that clip was from Enrico Kell. And President Lai, I'd just like to pose the question to you. He talked about the Belt and Road Initiative, and we also spoke about this uh, investment skepticism from China. Now, the threat that this new administration, this new Italian administration poses to the BRI, is it detrimental to an already stalling Chinese project? Or what's your outlook on the BRI in general in this case? I think the BRI in Italy probably uh I do not see a lot of future about the BRI in Italy, not because of the new government position toward BRI, but because of the China fundamental within Chinese economy. Uh, China does not have that kind of money to offer uh, to pull into the, uh, those uh, th uh, very expensive BRI projects. So we could see the, uh, what, what is happening in Sri Lanka and what could be happening uh, in other places such as Pakistan and uh, other uh, countries that have a huge BRI uh, project. And if those countries, uh, they are the less economic power and uh, uh, China does not have to put that kind of economic uh, punch uh, in order to sustain those projects and China cannot do it. So uh, when they talk about it with Italy, and Italy apparently they need something or they are wishing for something that will be more substantial in terms of how BRI can actually uh, provide for both China and Italy. And I do not think that China right now has the resources uh, uh, to support those BRI projects. The Chinese economy, if you look at the, this year, and also the fundamentals, they are really, really, really bad. Uh, not just to mention about how the, uh, uh, the COVID-19 and zero COVID policy has uh, trans translated into the exit China, uh, the trend, but also the demographic and the, uh, the people who can work and those are the people they need to support, uh, especially 10 years from now, you're going to see uh, probably just about the two-fifths uh, two of the population need to support the three-fifths of the populations there. So that is a very, very worrying trend. And so I do not see the, uh, the, uh, the future of the BI in, whether that's in Tele or other places, that would be good. Marcin, as a, an EU expert, would you agree? Is there a larger trend of worry for the BRI, uh, not just in Italy, but everywhere else? I think that there is definitely a concern about, firstly, China's ability to deliver on its um, very pompous uh, promises, which echoes Dr. Lai's point. But then I want to circle back to my earlier point about security considerations. I believe that especially when it comes to enhancing maritime connectivity, which is um, at the very heart of uh, the Belt and Road Initiative and China's uh, ambitions for international expansion, there is a growing concern around Europe and also outside of our, our region about what it means for the country to welcome Chinese investments in strategic sectors such as ports, uh, for example. And I think that those trends are reflected very well in Central and Eastern Europe. So um, just earlier this year, we saw the departure of two further countries from the uh, N plus one initiative, which is now down to 14 plus one after Latvia and Estonia left. So I believe that those concerns will translate not necessarily into um, the desire among European leaders, including Meloni, to completely shut off any channels of exchange with China, but hopefully will bring the European Union closer towards the 27 plus one model where Europe can speak with a, a unified voice with China. And whether it is feasible uh, with Italy's participation, of course, remains to be seen. I understand why there are concerns about the rise of um, far right and Meloni's uh, coalition in, in Italy, but one major difference that we really have to draw between her and the Five Stars movement is that even though at first glance they may appear to be ideologically close, the Five Stars movement emerged as an anti-establishment party. The, their decision to withhold support for the economic stimulus package and the national unity government also stems from this anti-establishment stance that they're taking. Meloni is not an anti-establishment uh, politician. I think that there is some credit to the claims of her populism. There is some credit to her claims of um, far-right populism specifically. But at the end of the day, she is embedded in broader, also pan-national structures, once again circling back to her leadership in ECR. So 
again, I wouldn't expect a total cutoff from China, but hopefully a move towards 27 plus one. It's great how you mentioned you know, her role in this um, whole EU pan kind of thing. What, how do you see her, her role in terms of being the leader of yeah, a member of the G7? Do you see Italy's role expanding? Do you see it being more assertive towards China and supporting Taiwan? Look at the dynamics as the Japan, United States, UK, they're pushing forward for the pro-Taiwan uh, resolution and language uh, in all kinds of G7 statements. And it is the country that they like France and uh, Germany and Italy. The three of them, they are uh, hesitant or some of them even re um, resist uh, about the certain language. So that was the dynamics in the last two years. Um, but I think the, uh, uh, with the Italy right now changing hand, and probably Italy could uh, either first uh, at a minimum switch side to United States, uh, King, uh, United Kingdom, as well, and Japan, and probably it, would Italy also uh, play a role as uh, another European, European, continental European power to persuade both the Germany and the France about their position. Uh, so we we'll have to wait and see. Um, let's. Take it back to security, and especially with the G7, Dr. Lai, you were saying um, sometimes these countries want to improve their ties with the United States. Now, for the United States, it's not Taiwan is not just an issue um, in the Pacific. Taiwan has been designated a first island chain. It's in the first island chain. Um, how much is this G7 initiative about um, protecting that first island chain and keeping uh, China restrained in from going into a blue water navy uh, Pacific operation. I think the G7 uh, is concerned about the stability across the Taiwan Straits. Uh, it is not about the containing China within the first island chain. Um, and if you look at the G7 uh, countries, uh, uh, UK uh, come out with a, uh, an integrated review, which has an Indo-Pacific tilt. And Canada is about to release its own Indo-Pacific strategy, although it has been working on that for about a year and is still working on that. But if you look, uh, but you look at other uh, countries, uh, Japan is a, the one, the first country that come up with its own Indo-Pacific strategies, uh, as uh, uh, come up by the Abe and the United States, so that they take uh, from Abe, Abe told him, and then the Emperor amplify and uh, revised. And also the, uh, the France and Germany, uh, they also come up with their own. And now what right now with Italy is uh, uh, having a lower end of statement, uh, probably uh, will uh, work within the uh, wider EU framework about the business strategy. So G7 uh, is a very unique combination that every one of them has its own Indo-Pacific strategy uh, positions. Uh, and uh, that is uh, also amplify how during the Cold War era, how the G7 as a kind of democratic power country club uh, tried to uh, manage uh, the uh, global affairs. And uh, right now, of course, G7 is not as dominant as it was in the past, but at least it can play a role.